August 2021 summer break. Uh, I feel like I haven't seen any of you for a while. We've been having, uh, I've been on vacation, been doing, working on some other projects, doing all this and that, so we missed July, but we are back. It's August. Today, we're going to go through start to finish creating the Woodwick candle, and in a future live, we'll work through a test or talk about the test results, whatever it is. So, I'm going to start us off by just covering a little bit of the basics of wood wicks and all that. I'll disclose that I haven't made wood wick candles at scale in any regard. And maybe some of what we talk about today will indicate why I haven't done that. And that's a personal choice I've made. If you're looking to run a business or start a business or augment a business, well, your choice if you want to take on the wood wick challenge and uh, build that into your product line. But today we're going we're gonna to kind of cover at a high level what they are. And then we're gonna crank out a few just to try them, just to work through the process. You'll see how similar it is to everything we've done. Maybe you're an expert in this realm, maybe not. Uh, if you are, let me know your thoughts. If you're seeing anything weird, if you're completely new, tell me what, what questions you have. So let's start talking about the different types of wood wicks. So the, the main wood wick that everyone sees is kind of this crackling wick. Uh, now, everything I'm going to show you today is from the Wood Wick Co. Wooden Wick Co., sorry. And they have a pretty strong patent, last time I read about it, uh, on Wood Wick. So if you're buying Wood Wicks in the United States, at least, it's probably from the Wooden Wick Co. Or one of their distributors, like Atkins and Pierce, if they're still doing it. I'm not sure. Um, and the reason is, if you try to make a Wood Wick, their patent, they might talk to you, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's not the point of this. The point is to talk that most of what you're going to buy is uh, from the Wooden Wick Co. So this is kind of your de facto main Wooden Wick material wick, if you will. And this is the labeled as the crackling wick. Now you can get the crackling wick and you can get what's called the, the whisper, whisper wick, whisper wick. And often the whisper wick, I guess I haven't opened this package. The whisper wick will be a lighter color, a little different. Uh, and the only difference between them is the primary difference between them is the, probably what is obvious, the crackling wick will crackle, the whisper wick will not crackle as much. It's quieter, typically. So you see there's a color difference. This is the normal crackling wick. This is the whisper wick. And I, you will probably not be able to see it there, but these are actually a little bit different thicknesses. The reason is uh, there's two dimensions on every wick. So think about cotton wicks for a second. Cotton wicks, you buy a CD10, you buy an HTP73, HTP105, uh, you might buy an Eco3. Uh, there's just one number. There's the letters, there's the number. And, and that indicates something with regards to the diameter. So the larger the number, typically the larger the wick, the more wax it'll draw through. Wooden wicks, on the other hand, have a separate sizing. It's not one number, it's two. The first number indicates how wide the wick is. The second number indicates how thick the wick is. So when you're sizing wooden wicks, you're actually looking at two numbers. And these will be indicated typically by a, uh, uh, an X. So this, in this case, this is a 0.02, and that's inches, I believe. 0.02 inches thickness by, and then on their packaging, they usually provide you with a chart. You can see that this is the maximum width inside of this package. That's 0.75 inches. So inside of this same pack, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, you can find 0 0.375, 0 0.5, 0 0.625, and then this size 0.75 which makes sizing seem like you're gonna have a lot of choices, right? You now have to pick not only a thickness, but a width, and who knows what the right answer is. Well, when it comes to sizing a wooden wick, even though it seems like you have more choices, with regards to recommendations made on the chart and my experience with it, you actually have less choices with wooden wicks than you do with cotton wicks uh, for a given diameter container. And uh, we'll kind of get to that. Okay. So these are kind of the main wicks. I think I've talked pretty, pretty in depth about them. The other type of wick that you'll see with wooden wicks is what's called the booster wick. And these booster wicks, 
uh, are the same as a normal crackling whip wick, with one exception. They splice an extra piece of wood onto the wick. So you can see that, that secondary piece of wood there. And the point of that is it helps draw more wax, kind of gives the wick a little more oomph. Regardless, you won't see any differences in sizing with it. It's still going to be a width and a thickness. You kind of ignore the booster when you're doing that. You just know it's a booster wick. It's going to have a little more draw, a little more power. Uh, for the most part, so paraffin is a little less dense than soy. So I'll use those two as my example. Paraffin will play well with the normal wick. The booster wick, because it has that oomph, will draw up natural waxes like soy a lot better because it's so thick, it's viscous, kind of need that extra oomph to get that wax to draw up through the wick. Think about what we've talked about in the course with regards to how that wick draws up that liquid fuel and it creates a combustion environment where that oxygen and the, the fire and the liquid wax plus the fragrance oil if it's there all works together so the booster wick is for natural waxes usually better the normal wick is better for the paraffins i've struggled in a few ways but i've struggled to get my soy wax candles to work very well with the non-booster wicks I've had better success with the booster wicks. So you can buy these in a variety of sizes. They've also, they also offer the spiral wicks, which are, I'll pull one out here, but the spiral wicks are exactly what they sound like. They come in a tube because it's just a, pretty much just a piece of wood in a spiral. So that's all that is. They are, I have not found them to be easy to work with to get that consistency that you want. And in the entire wooden wick environment, I have found that because it's wood, it's very natural. It's gonna be actually, most of this stuff is a combination of woods. It's not one type of wood, it's balsa and pine. Actually, I've got the list here. It's uh, a few things put together, um, which you can read about in their patent. And if I can find it here. Yeah, so, uh, combination of cherry, oak, birch, maple, balsa, rosewood, and it can be any amount of those and anything. It's within the patent, it's kind of their, their trade secret, so you won't find an exact amount. Uh, so the point of that is, wooden wicks are a very natural product. Just like wax is a natural product or it's derived from natural products, the struggle with that is consistency because it, there's not so much order in it. With, with a cotton wick, for instance, those are manufactured in very controlled environments. And it's all, I mean, cotton is natural, yes. But the procedures and the systems we have around them allow us to create those, allow manufacturers to create those in much more consistent ways so that their behavior is what you expect. And Eco 10 is often gonna be an Eco 10. If you remember uh, last year, the HTT, HTP wicks were redone caused a little turmoil in the candle community because people who relied on those HTP wicks, they were getting the same thing every time. And they changed how those wicks were made so that the same size, same number, same specification was actually behaving differently. So I think it had to do with the literal yarn or material that that wick was made of. Enough said. So today we're going to make a candle we're actually gonna make four candles in these containers here from start to finish. So I'll walk you through my process and I'm gonna use the templates that we have, that we used in the course that you may have. These are PDFs. Um, this is just an e-template, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and I'm gonna walk through and take my notes and do my calculations right here. And then we'll revisit these in the future and burn them and see how they do. Uh, so without, further ado let's get going so in our notes uh for me you know i mean you probably know this I'm, I'm a big planner before we do anything before we measure anything let's figure out what the heck we want to do so the plan right now is to make four candles in this container four different wick sizes wooden wick sizes in this container that's what i want to do i'm going to call my candle id a combination of the date that we're pouring which would be today so or depending on where you are so this is actually i'm going to put the year 21 the month 08 for August 
and the day, which is 21. These are wooden wood candles, so I'm gonna do a dash W for fun, uh, and then dash one, first batch of the day. So I'm that's my batch. I'm gonna I'm labeling the batch. That's what I'm putting up here uh, on that template. If you don't have these, let me know. These are available in the course. They should be all downloadable. If you're watching this later or a replay or you weren't a member of the course, uh, it's a cool benefit of the course. We got a lot of worksheets just like this that help you walk through the whole process. So pour date would be today. So that's 8 2021 And I'll share this uh, with everybody later. So wax type today, we're gonna to use Nature Wax C3 soy wax. A lot of what we covered in the course, we're gonna kind of stick with it today. And the point is it makes it a little more interesting with wood wicks with what I mentioned about vegetable wax and how you need that booster wick. We'll make one without the booster wick just to show how, uh, how that operates. So Nature Wax C3 soy wax. Supplier in this case, whoa. Got a couple here. This one will be from Lone Star. Lone Star. And then I'm too lazy to look up the lot number. In fact, I think this bag didn't have a lot number on it and I was too lazy to chase them on that. So I'm just gonna leave that blank. Fragrance oil today. Uh, I know they've been getting a lot of hate lately, but shout out to Aztec. We're gonna use some Aztec. Uh, tobacco cedar is what we're gonna make it out of. And uh, that is not me condoning tobacco use, but I am condoning the use of tobacco cedar fragrance oil. Supplier in this case is Aztec. And let's go with the low, nice and low fragrance load of 6.5%. 6.5%. So here's what I've got so far. Right up here on the top. Blah, 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 blah. Hopefully that's not flipped around on you guys. All right, container and mold. We're gonna call this our uh, white jar. Very creative. White jar, material is glass. Capacity, let's uh, measure that now. So actually I'm gonna flip over from this template to our math template, which is where we'll do all the figure out what the capacity is and all that. You've probably seen this, um, where we're gonna walk through a all the way down to L. Uh, by the end, we'll have exactly the numbers we need for our batch, 6.5% with the C3 soy wax. We'll assume a specific gravity, not important really. Um, we'll just kind of walk through what we have here. So the first thing I need to measure is the weight of the empty container. So make sure you've got one of these bad boys, a scale. Turn it on. Empty container, I'm gonna use grams today. You can use ounces. Don't use fluid ounces. We hopefully have covered that to death, but I found myself accidentally on the fluid ounces tab. So this weighs, if I stop talking, it changes 208 grams. In fact, I'll do one of these. I'll try to get a better, better flow on this. Don't mind my, uh, the view. So 208 grams on that, 208 grams, weight of container filled with water. So I'm going to take 209, 208, we'll just pretend that's the same thing. Take my water here, this is just water, nothing special, and fill it up to where I expect I will pour our candle to. I leave a little bit for lids, whatever else goes on top. It looks like 426 is what I'm seeing there, 426, 426 grams. So that's the container plus the water. Now C is calculate the weight of water, which is subtracting the two from each other, if that makes sense. So weight of water is B minus A, whip out my calculator, you can use your phone, but my phone is currently recording a Facebook Live, so I can't, so 426 minus 208, 218 grams, 218. Number of similar containers, we're gonna make four today. I'm gonna to put this aside. So we're gonna do four candles today. So one, two, three, four. That'll give us a good range. We can try a lot of wicks with that. So I'm just gonna place four into that. And then our conversion factor is 
we're going to use 0.86. Uh, the average is 0.857. We're going to use 0 0.86 just to make it simple. Move these. And uh, probably not going to write it up to now, but I will do one of these. So now, if you've never used this worksheet before, we're going to do the total weight. So total weight of wax, or sorry, total weight of the whole candle is going to be C times D times E. C is the weight of water. D is the number of candles, so we have four, and then our conversion factor of 0.86. So I'll multiply those all together. 218 times 4 times 0.86 gives me 749.9, and round it up, 750. So that number, that total weight, is if I was to make my candle right now with this container and put all four of them on the scale at once, uh, minus the weight of the container itself, we'd have 750 grams of wax. Whatever that is per candle, I don't, I don't know. All right, so fragrance load percentage is G here. If you've got this and following along, we're gonna use 6.5, that's what we said earlier, 6.5%. The decimal is G divided by 100, so that's gonna be 0 0.065. And then the conversion is one plus what that is. Now, if you're just following along, it, doesn't make sense, but it makes it easy. It's just one calculation at a time. So wax conversion, one plus H, H being, that didn't work well, H being that number right there. So that's 1.065, 1 1.065. The wax weight required. So this is, now this is where we have a good, uh, good starting point. Wax weight required is F, which is the total weight, divided by I, which is the wax conversion, 1.065. So that's 750 divided by 1.065. And that is uh, 704 point a lot. So we're gonna do 704 grams. Fragrance weight required, looks like it cut off on my sheet here, but fragrance weight would be the remainder, right? 750 grams is the candles, 704 grams is the wax, the rest has to be fragrance oil. So, 750 minus 704 is 46 grams. So boom, there we go. So that is our filled out worksheet. You can see what we've got there. If you can read my handwriting, cool. So before we continue with taking notes, let's go ahead and just start measuring out some of our supplies here. So we know, now we know that we have we need 704 grams of wax and 46 grams of fragrance oil. So we'll weigh out our wax now, which I'll do right here. I'll do it like that, I guess. No, nope, I'm gonna do it sideways because I'll just do it this way. I can't see what I put there. And I'm gonna weigh it directly in the pour pitcher, which is, we'll pretend it's clean. It's clean enough. I'm gonna tear it out. So we're at zero and we need 700 and four grams. So, I've got all my wax over here. I'm not going to show you guys. I'll just scoop it in. So that's 195. Four sixty-one. Seven oh nine, seven oh nine is pretty close. So we just gotta take a few out. Seven oh three. I'm persnickety, so we're gonna go for it. Seven oh four. Take it off before it changes. <laughs> um, and let's start melting this bad boy. So I've just got um, a hot plate right there. That's what we're gonna do. Okay, so. Melt that down. Um, we'll check our temperature with an IR thermometer. My personal favorite, easiest thing to do. Okay, now let's talk about our wicks while this is getting down. Actually, before we get to wicks, let's do our fragrance oils. Just so we have everything measured out. So fragrance oil, I'm gonna tear out this scientific jar. By the way, I love these. Couldn't recommend them enough. If you don't have them or something great, 
Uh, they're good. So they're reusable, they're cleanable, and they're tapered on this thing. 46 grams. So I am um, big fan of the, the lids with the little thingy, whatever you call that, <laughs> squirting device. I don't know. Uh, let you siphon out exactly pretty accurately what you need to get in. So we're at 40, oh boy. Oh, we need 46, we're at 45. Forty-six. Cheers. All right, we'll just set that aside. Now we'll talk about wicks. So there's a lot we can do here, uh, but where I like to start always with wicks is if I've never done it before, and that's what we're going to pretend, is go to the wick sizing chart. I left a link in our pro group. Um, I send this out in the email newsletter. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of this chart, but these are the recommendations given by. The wooden wick co for your wax and for whatever type of wick you want to use so the first thing they say to do and i'm going to pull it open here and i'll just kind of flash it in front is to oh boy not sure how well we're going to do this but step one is going to be measure the diameter of the container that you're using so diameter remember if you were like me in school, diameter is end to end, longest possible distance. This is the circumference all the way around. Don't do that. Uh, so we're pretty much, it's upside down. We'll call that three inches. Three inches, sure. It's a little less than three inches. We're gonna call it three inches. Um, not terribly important. So if I go to my diameter, chart on the wooden wick sizing guide. We've got three inches, three inches. I can choose, now I know we're using soy wax. So I'm gonna look at three inches, go to my soy wax, can, yeah, so this is the soy wax column. Three inches is one of these rows here. So depending on what we're gonna do. Now their recommendation is don't use the original flat wick. Like I said, they don't support any sizing around that simply because they say it won't. We're gonna use it anyways. Uh, but they're saying use the crackling booster wick, so the booster wick, or the booster wick that doesn't crackle, the whisper wick, they call it. Um, so we're going to use the size in, so we got four, so let's do this. We'll do the right way, most of the right way. We'll do two wicks in the crackle. We'll do two wicks in the non-crackle. So if I go three inches and I move over on soy, on the crackling booster wick, that gives us, use a 0 0.04 by 0.5 inches. Oh, and I might not have any more 0.04s left, which makes this even more interesting. Here's a booster, 0.02. Ah, perfect. So here we go. Crackling booster, 0.04. So I'll talk about this quick. If you've never done wood wicking and you wanna figure out what to do and you're not sure what to buy because you don't wanna buy a lot of something you don't know, I love the wood wick sample pack. They, get, they send you one of every single thing. You can try almost all their different sizes and regardless of where you end up, you get to have a little bit of fun. So uh, that's what I've done several times actually, uh, just to kind of restock my inventory. Cause like I said, I've never poured at scale. So the recommendation is 0.04 by 0.5. So I'm gonna, these are all 0.4. 0.5 is the second largest in their list. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I'm just gonna pull it out till I find the size that is 0.5 inches or half an inch if you wanna use normal terminology. Do -do -do. 0.625, so I need something a little smaller than that. A little smaller than that, there we go. So there we go. Um, here's how I'm doing that. Uh, hold it to their thing there. You can also use an actual tape measure, although I'm not sure I've ever tried this, but yeah, it, it does end up being, ooh, that's gonna be hard to see. It does end up being half an inch there. Okay, so we're gonna do one in this size. Uh, so let's label that as we go, since they're a little harder to tell what they're doing. Uh, doo -doo -doo. We'll do one in that size and we'll do one bigger than that too. Um, and normally I would say do one bigger, do the size recommended and do one smaller and then test and adjust. 
since we're going to kind of play around with things here, we'll try. Uh, well, we're not going to follow that exactly is kind of what I'm saying. So this is the booster, booster 0 0.04, 0 0.04 by 0.5, 0 0.5 inches. And we'll label our container. So I think you can see all that. Yeah, cool. So boom, that's one. We'll go one size bigger. So one size bigger, I'm going to keep the same thickness, 0.04. I'm going to go up one uh, width, or yeah, one width. So 0.625 would be the next size up. So that would be this bad boy right here, 0.625. So that covers two thirds of what I would normally do. Now I would then take a 0.375, which is the size down from the recommendation, and I would use, make a game out of that. So we'll label that. This is the 0 0.04 by 0.625 crackle, or normal, or whatever you want to call it. Painter's tape is my number one recommended, recommended labeling, short-term temporary labeling for testing. So I've got two of those. Now let's flip over. We'll do, we'll try the, uh, the normal wick, the normal size one, which comes, actually the normal one only comes in a 0 0.02 and a 0 0.03. So maybe I do have a 0 0.03. If not, we'll use the whisper, which I definitely still have some left over of that. Do, do, do. So boom, crackling wick 0 0.03. So that's the largest of their normal wick size that they have. So I'm gonna, just going to match the same sizes that we did with the booster wick, and we'll be able to see a pretty big difference, I think, between those two things. So I'm going to use the 0.5 and the 0.625, just like we did there. Um, I could do 0.65 and 0.75, knowing that we need a little extra juice. But for the sake of argument, we'll just uh, we'll do it that way. Okay, so don't mind me while I work on figuring out what is those size. So this one is, this is a 0 0.5, 0 0.5, we'll label that, 0 0.03 thickness times 0 0.5 inches crackle. Oh, and I, I misspoke. This is actually a booster. Booster. You should be able to see it by looking at it, but um, I don't leave any doubts. I did write booster on that one. 0.03 by 0.5 crackle, or single ply is the other term. And now we need a 0.625. That's too big. 0.625, there we go, 0.625. Yeah, 0.625. Cool. 0.03, 0.03 by 0 0.625. Crackle, non-booster, single ply. Cool. So now we spread our wings pretty far on, on the wood wicks for this container. For every container in the cotton wick world, I think this is my most recent math on this. So feel free to fact check me. But uh, when you look at recommendations, you go up one, you go down, depending on the size. If you're using cotton wicks, you usually have about 15 to 20 choices when you talk about using potentially every type of cotton wick when you make a candle. With wooden wicks, you only have about 10 to 15 choices depending on what you use. So it's actually, despite the width and the thickness being in play, there's so few, there might there's only four different widths on these, and there's only two or so thicknesses, your options are, are actually more limited. Um, there's more cotton wick types, there's more cotton wick diameters that can go into play, and it's just a simple function of that. Now, we talked about the nuance of having fragrance oil and container and room and all that. Obviously, there's, there's more at play, but just on the surface level of thinking about sizing, you have less options with wooden wicks. The implication then is when you're testing and you need to make an adjustment, you can only adjust so far. So I've had candles where, hey, the wood wick was too big, and going down just one size is too small. Put itself out. 
Um, so that's one of the down, downfalls of that. The other downfall, like we talked about, is that wooden wicks are a natural product. They have a lot of stuff in it, cellulose and combinations of wood, and the manufacturing is not as, um, I mean, I won't say it's not as good, but it's, it's of a different material, meaning there's a lot of variations of what can happen in those candles. So, um, but something else I really do like about wood wicks, so this is the tabs. Um, they hold, obviously they hold the wood wick, but uh, you don't have to secure the wick in any way. You just pop it in and, and let it go. Now you can buy variations of these tabs that are shorter or taller in this neck region. I, there's a term for it, I can't remember. Um, depending on when you want the candle, if let's say it's good, it's burning all the way down. When it hits that, it's not gonna burn anymore. So it's kind of a safety feature. Uh, rather than having it burn all the way to the bottom, which I'll admit a lot of my cotton candles do, cotton wick candles do. So I'm just going to put these tabs on, and then I will still use a wick sticker to stick this to the center. And then we'll check on our wax, which should be getting pretty close. Oh, not even close. I was scared of leaving it and forgetting about it, so I turned it down too far, but we'll let that melt. All right, and then we will stick these. I have stickers somewhere, somewhere in front of me. Here we go. So just normal stickers. These are, I prefer the stickers over glue dots or hot glue, just more for, they're just easy. There's nothing wrong with hot glue. There's nothing wrong with other options. Uh, if you get too sticky, you can't reuse your containers. And since we're testing, I wanna be able to undo this later. So I'm just gonna eyeball these. Not bad. Not bad at all. Push that down. See, there's a little overflow. It doesn't fit it perfectly, but it works. And I'm not pushing them down super hard. I'm not cramming them. They're just uh, lightly affixed. Now, another thing to consider with wooden wicks is their moisture level. There are people that talk about soaking them in oil, like uh, olive oil or even wax prior to using them in a candle. And this is, the theory is it has to do with changing the moisture level, getting the air out of it, because um, depending on how dry or how wet they are, uh, it is wood after all, uh, you can get different results. I've never subscribed to that, not saying that it's not something you should do, but I'm always in favor of things that limit the amount of overhead you have to do to make your candles. I'd rather uh, assume enough about the consistency so that I can batch them and do a lot without a lot of prep work on the front end. And that's mostly because I'm lazy, but also because you have to remember that even though there are some inconsistencies with the product as far as getting the same test results every time, that these are manufactured for candle making use. And the assumption from the companies is, uh, at least with Woodwicks, is you can use them without any preparation. You don't have to, shouldn't have to do anything. Not to say you can't, but you shouldn't have to, it's kind of with wax. I get questions all the time. Should I add Vibar? Should I be thinking about this? Should I use these additives? And my response is you can, but remember these are commercially designed and manufactured waxes for candle making. They've thought of all this and some of them have some of that stuff built in, some don't. But <laughs> the intention is that you can buy it off the shelf or online and you can make a candle from it and you shouldn't have to do anything to it. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for additives, but they do serve, they, they serve a role that sometimes the manufacturer has already thought of that for you, for us, so that you don't have to spend so much time doing that. And this is quite a bit of wax, so it's still 
taking this time melting. I'm gonna grab my stir stick. I forgot to grab that. It's just across the room here, so I'll be right back. Um, not the most glamorous stir stick, but it works. So let's take a look at these again. So inside, as, as we're waiting, we've got everything labeled. Actually, let's hop back over to our notes and get those um, back to what we need. So Because we haven't recorded certain things like the room temp or anything like that. And we want to be able to refer to all this later, wig size and all that. So uh, flipping back over. and I'll share all of this uh, in our group once I'm done. Okay, so we're not gonna use any dyes, so there's a whole section on, I'm back here now, I'm looking at kind of the design of our candle. There's a whole section on dye, we're not using it, so I'm just gonna leave it blank. No dye. Capacity of the container, we now know how much each container can hold, actually, that's one calculation I didn't do, but it's the very last one, which is the individual candle weight. I'm back on the math sheet now. Individual candle weight is the F, which is the total weight of all the candles, all the wax here, divided by the number of candles that we're making, which is four. So that's 750 grams, 750 divided by four. Each of these will hold 188 grams of stuff, stuff being wax and fragrance oil, if we had it. 188 grams. So that's the capacity of the candle. If we were to make a label for this to follow the rules and, and the consumers were like, oh, how much candle do I get? We would say this candle is 188 grams. Yeah, that's right. It just seems really high. That, that, that's right. Gotta be right. We've never, I've never made a mistake in my life. Uh, where were we? Okay, design. Capacity of 188 grams. Wick size uh, varies. We're going to say we've got crackling. Actually, I'm going to write single ply, not crackling for that. Single ply. And this is 0.03 by 0.5 inches and 0.03 by 0.625. And then we've got crackling, crack, or sorry, <laughs> I keep saying that. Booster, booster, 0.02 by 0 0.5, 0 0.02 by 0.625. So we're there. All right, we're getting down there, we're getting close. Wick supplier, The Wooden Wick Co. Okay, temperature management plan. I guess I haven't talked at all about what I'm doing over here, just out of, out of sight. Uh, max wax temperature. This is C3 soy wax. My recommendation is land it between 185 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's 85 to 87 degrees Celsius, I believe, but I'm gonna use Fahrenheit because it's what I know better. So 185 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, we'll try to land it in there. And just to kind of fill everyone in, that's kind of where I'm at in the process. So we're gonna add our FO, our fragrance oil at 185 as well, or I'm gonna to try to. I'm, I'm kind of taking liberties with what I'm writing here because we'll see what reality is. If I have to go back and change this, I will. Pour temp, now that's that's an interesting one. Where do we want to pour this? I'm gonna plan on pouring it at 170, and that's somewhat arbitrary. We talked before that pour temp is one of those things that you can manipulate, but pour temp doesn't affect hot throw. Pour temp actually impacts the appearance of the candle. If in your environment, in your system, your pour temp leaves you with craters and problems and whatever else, it's something you can try to change to get a better appearance at the at the end. 
if things do go sideways on you and you end up with some weird looking candle tops, it's nothing that a heat gun can't fix. Um, if you can find the right pour temp where let's call it nine out of 10 candles look right, don't have craters, nothing under the surface. Well, that's a great place to be because then that one out of 10 that you have to manually fix or clear out or deal with, that's way less overhead than the other ones. But if they're all coming out bad, all that you have to do is ch change a pour temp or that's where I would start. Um, typically that's what deals handles most problems. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and we're actually going to cover some of that in the time management plan section of this, which if you're following along or if you if you have this anywhere, um, we're going to fill that out. So we're going to add the FO at 185. We're going to pour at, I'm going to call it about 170 degrees Fahrenheit, just picking a number. We'll see what happens. I have some things I like to do with C3, but well, we're going to see it. Remember, we're doing wood wicks, but that has really nothing to do with this section. So curing temperature, I'm going to say the room is going to stay between 68 and 74 is where it's at now. It gets hot. I'm actually on the second story. 68 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. We're not going to preheat our jars. So just to flash where I'm at with that, that's kind of what I've put. So time management plan. Post adding the fragrance oil, stirring length. How long are we going to stir that until we're done stirring it. it. <laughs> How long are we gonna stir our fragrance oil? For me, it, it's two minutes, religiously two minutes. So I'll say 120 seconds or two minutes. Now, how much time is gonna pass between when we hit the max temperature of 185 and when we add our fragrance oil? And it's gonna be less than 15 seconds, right? I'm gonna take the wax off at the max temp and at that point, I'm going to add fragrance oil. So I'm going to say less than 10 seconds. How much time is going to pass between when we add the fragrance oil and we pour? This is an interesting one. I don't know. We're going to estimate that. I'm not going to run a timer. You could, but I'm not going to get that detailed with it. Uh, we'll estimate it. I know we're going to stir for two minutes. We may pour because it may have reached 170 at that point. But if we have to wait a little bit for it to hit 170, then we'll just kind of guesstimate. So I'm gonna leave that blank for now. And then how long do we want to cure? I'm gonna leave that blank as well. I don't know when we're gonna cure. If it's gonna be two weeks, if it's gonna be a month, if we do this in a follow-up lesson, I may burn one, burn a couple just to make sure they look good or they aren't horrible. I mean, whatever, we'll see. So I'm gonna leave that blank too. So heat source, now this is more logistical, like what is your system for making the candles? So now we're down in this section here where we're talking about what you're doing. The more you know about this batch and you look at how it ended up, the happier you can be with the uh, process that you're using. Is my stir stick maybe causing problems? I don't know. I can make another batch later and change one thing, that being how I'm stirring it, and maybe I get a different result. Kind of a fun thing to experiment with. It can be expensive as far as using up wax and jars and inventory. It can take time, but the patience is worth it. A lot of times uh, these iterations give you data, give you experience, and you get a lot better at kind of managing multiple things at once. A little like I'm doing here, though this isn't terribly crazy, but still got a big ball of wax. I'm just gonna give it a, a break it up in there. Uh, it's like the trash island that's floating in the Pacific Ocean right now. Okay. There we go. That definitely is gonna need some time. Okay, so heat source, in this case, I'm using, uh, I'm just using a hot plate with a pour pot on top. So I'm going to say hot plate. Stir stick is, I think it's plastic, plastic spatula. I've also been known to use a wooden spoon or <laughs> just shaking the stupid container. I don't do that often though. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Thermometer, we're using an IR. IR, and then I'm gonna just call out the, the brand. Helect. Helect. Wick style. Wick style. I don't know. I don't know what that means. It's been a while since I've used this template. 
um, just because I've been ripping out the same candles. Uh, equipment list, pouring pot, pouring pot, pouring pot, aluminum pour pot. I think this is the four quart, aluminum four quart. Okay. Uh, ambient conditions, always recommend doing that. Temperature, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It's getting hotter. It's also right by the hot plate. So I don't know if the room is actually that temperature. Humidity, 43%. Um, so we're getting up there. And then the cure temperature, we calling it out. It'll be between 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 74. Cool. So then post pour evaluation, which we won't do on this live, is where we'll talk about, hey, did we get good adhesion and mold release? We'll scale that one to 10. How do we feel about that? Uh, cold throw, you know, just does this candle give me good vibes or not? And then top smoothness, which is usually what most people care the most about, because that can cause more than just uh, cosmetic problems with your candle. So top smoothness, one to 10. If we don't have anything under the surface and I'm, I'm gonna poke it with a skewer after just to make sure, then that would be a 10. If it comes out and it's bumpy and gross, uh, that would probably be however I'm feeling, but definitely like a five to a seven. Um, and if it's got craters under the surface, craters on the surface, that's gonna be a one to a three. I don't know how you score four because I didn't mention four. Uh, that being said, that's kind of the point. So that's how, that's, that's, this is the tool I can use to improve my processes. Um, when I'm trying to get consistent with the same jar, same fragrance oil, so that I can really scale what I'm doing, I want to understand everything, all the inputs. Inputs are more than just your materials. Materials are inputs, you know, wax, what um, fragrance oil you're using, what wicks are you using. But your other inputs are the things like what, Am I using to melt my wax? You know, am I losing, maybe I'm losing uh, volume when I transfer from a Presto pot into a pour pot because some of it stays over. Or maybe I'm introducing air because my stirring apparatus or my stirring style is too aggressive. Well, you kind of have to be aware of that one, I guess. We don't ask how aggressive you're stirring on, on the worksheet, but uh, it's kind of up to your discretion, but without knowing your inputs, how can you map your, your process, your environment and your materials to your outputs and know what to change if things aren't going well, because we all know candles are fickle. So this is not melting any faster off the hot plate. So we can put it back on. I was just breaking up some of the, the waxicles that were still in there. So cool, we're, we're on the home stretch. This is, this is just about done melting. We've got stuff here. If anybody has questions, if you're watching live, you can, I think you can leave a, leave a comment. If you're watching a replay, leave a comment and I'll, I'll take a look at it when I do. <laughs> uh, I don't have any more summer breaks planned between now and the end of the year. Summer break has come and gone and that's okay. Um, yeah, so cool. I don't have any filler material. I don't have any song or dance to perform to try to entertain you in the meantime. So cool. I think we're, we're pretty well set. We've got our candles here. Uh, let's see what temperature we're at. It's almost all the way melted. We're at 160. If you've noticed, the more you're melting at once, the harder it is to bring that entire thing up. And also, if you're, if you're batching large enough, uh, I recommend heavily, make sure you're, you're stirring pretty frequently. Because the more wax you have in there, the more of a differential or difference you'll have between the temperature of the bottom layer of wax in your melting apparatus and the top. 
uh, obviously the, the heat source in, in this case with the, with the hot plate underneath it, the heat source is going to heat whatever's right next to it, that heat percolates up through. The wax at the top, if not stirred, will take longer to heat up. Because of convection currents or whatever the smart thing is, I would say that the it will eventually get there, but there'll be a lot of difference. So you, you'll end up melting faster if you can get the top less hot wax down to the bottom. So I, I guess what I'm saying, long way of saying, just make sure to keep stirring with some frequency when you have a lot of wax in here. So for reference, yeah, you can see this whole thing. We're at 170. Uh, when I put the dry wax in, it was filled to probably about right there, and now the wet wax is down to right here. So really that does take a lot, lot less space in its liquid form, which isn't a surprise. Um, or maybe it is for some of you, but, um, but they weigh the same. So what, liquid or solid, I got this question the other day, is hey, when I melt this down, is it a different weight? Like, am I supposed to measure the solid weight or the liquid weight? Well, the answer is you can do either, they're the same. But when you're measuring solid, it takes up more space. So it can be harder for making a large batch if you have a Presto pot that can hold a bit or a large pour pot or you're doing a lot of candles that you haven't done before. It can be harder to measure the dry weight. So you can measure it down into the liquid weight and fill it, find your weight that way. But that usually you want two pour pots, one to do all that in and one to actually siphon the amount that you need, depending on what you calculate uh, to melt that down into that. Marsha, thank you. Yes, the course was put together for that purpose. It's not an advanced course. You're not going to run a business or take over Yankee Candle with the course, but it's exactly, I'm glad it's meeting you where you were because that, that was the point, is to kind of bootstrap you with the foundational skills so that you know um, how to walk around, how to get where you're going. It's kind of a GPS for getting started. So let's see where we're at. Kind of accelerated our, our heat a little bit. We're at 180, so we're really close. Super, super close. And yeah, I, um, the candle industry is interesting right now. If you're trying to get into the business side with the supply chain issues, with the wax formulations that seem to be changing every single week, it can be hard to nail that down. Even if you're just doing it as a hobby, as soon as you introduce a new batch of the same wax, I've seen it being really inconsistent. So when we talk about going through, finding your baseline wick, um, working through the fragrance oil long for a long time we were well, i shouldn't even say for a long time for a period it was relatively consistent i could buy c3 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 over time and there weren't too many changes to my wicks but now i'm finding that unless i buy a lot from the same lot or let's just say like 150 pounds at once or 50 pounds at once even depending on where you're at uh you want to get it to be as close to the same time of manufacturing as before because I don't know why I don't know why but the the wax consistencies the wax is not been as consistent um, which affects your wicking which affects your safety and can affect your performance too so it's been a little bit of a journey we are like two degrees away okay two degrees just hang tight we are so close we're gonna have these candles and I think in next months live we'll talk through if not start or continue a burn test on one of these bad boys uh, what i'd like to do is work through some designs some try out some weird stuff as a group so like hey what happens when you do put a lot of beeswax into your soil or what happens when you just make a beeswax container candle because why not why can't you do that um, let's prove some of the myths of the candle industry. So we're at, well, actually we're at 185. So I'm gonna cut the heat, cut the heat, 185, which is about what we wrote down. Take my uh, fragrance oil we measured earlier, put that in there. Alexa, set a timer for two minutes. Use my timer. Just to be extra. Uh, where do we put this? Put that back there. So we'll just stir this 
and then we'll check temperature. And then if we're around 170, I think whatever it is, I'm going to pour at just hoping to get it around 170. Not a big deal if it's, if it's wrong. Cause we're just, we just want to know where we're at. So the next time we can make an adjustment uh, from there. So sometimes it just, it's just a matter of starting uh, to understand where you got to go. A lot of people are trying to shoot for that right answer right away. They want to get it right. I want to get it right too. But you got to remember progress is better than perfection because perfection is the enemy of good. It's going to be hard to get it right. And you may end up procrastinating like I've done. Never starting because you were afraid you'd get the wrong answer right away. It's just a process. The only way to get through to where you got to go is to try something. Try something. Figure out how did it turn out? What do I got to change? What am I thinking about? And treat it more like a game instead of a test, you know? Um, <laughs> makes candle making so much more fun. Um, I've got, I mean, I've talked about it before. I've got a graveyard of lots of candles that I've started burning. And maybe they started sitting or maybe they tunneled or maybe the, the top looked horrible. There's so many of them. Um, and almost all of them, I'd like to believe that I walked away with a lesson. Hey, this didn't work or this worked really well in the case, but those I typically end up burning or giving away to friends and family. You know, this design was awesome. And I have those marked. I have a, it's a kind of a short list of designs that worked out really, really well uh, that I know I can just go back to and crank out a candle with that wax and that wick and that container. For the most part, it's going to be great. Um, if I don't get uh, in too much trouble with the reformulations or the inconsistencies of wax. We're close. Alexa, stop. 170 on the dot, if you would believe that. Here. Hopefully it didn't change in the two seconds I said that. 170. Boom! Okay. So 170. That's crazy, right? 15 degrees of drop. Let's do our pour now. I typically stand up doing this. Let's see what happens. That's not a big deal if we make a mess. Okay. So 170, we'll just kind of pour these in. Not too fast, not too slow, just nice and gentle. Let's get this down here. And then just, since we're not holding the wicks accountable, we'll make sure that they're centered when we're done. Oh, there's a drip. I'm not going to go all the way to the top right away. I'm going to go back through and top these off so that they're all about the same level. Well, that one I got a little carried away with. No big deal. And we got our newest member of the Empty Pour Pot Club. So cool. All right. We'll just kind of seat these up. Get them where we need them to go. I think that's pretty good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put these bad boys in a safe place. Um, I'll post some pictures. I'll kind of keep everyone updated. Clean up my mess. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how these go. And we'll trim them, obviously, before we do anything with them. You don't leave your wood wicks up that high. They're five inches in the pack, by the way. So if you're thinking about doing like a mason jar or something that's really tall, woodwicks are probably not your friend. Yeah, I think that those are relatively centered. You can always, it's always easier to tell after the it's too late, <laughs> uh, I found. But I'll, I'll post up some pictures in our group. Uh, we'll kind of watch these take progress. Uh, I may do a live when I start the test, just kind of ad hoc or like with little notice. Um, but I'll, I'll put our notes up in the group at some point when I get to it have some things today so I'm not going to do it right away um, and then we'll we'll kind of watch what happens with these it's a great experiment so c3 soy wax wood wicks two boosters two non-boosters which I'm not expecting to do well but sometimes you get surprises happy little coincidences so we'll see what happens anyways that's our that's our Argus Q&A uh, a little bit over time no big deal whatever I hope you have a great week I hope you make beautiful candles. Uh, stay tuned for updates, and I'll see you later. If you've got any questions, comments, leave them here. Take care, everyone. Bye.